Oh, oh, live. Yeah, we're live now. See that? It's Good morning, North America. America. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Hello, all four watchers on a Friday. Yes. <laughs> Hang out with James Fee, season three. Special guest, Paul Ramsey. Paul, how you doing? I'm doing really well. It's oh, been a great spring. The birds are singing. The cherry blossoms are blooming. Sadly, not outside my window, but down the street. They are. Otherwise, I'd show you a picture. That's a live yeah. in Victoria, but in Phoenix, obviously, you're blasé about these things. But here we say, look, cherry blossoms. February. That's great. <laughs> oh, cool. Cool. So, um... For those that don't know, Paul uh, of uh, Boundless Geo fame is now at uh, Cardo DB. Yeah. How's that? You, you said you were two weeks into this, huh? Two weeks in. This is the end of week two. Week two. They sent me a t shirt. Yeah. business the cards? Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no business cards yet. That would be professional. I don't want to yeah, yeah. get too deep into the pool right out of the gate. I was just checking maybe, to see maybe if uh, conference season starts. Yeah, the comp yes, that's about to start here. So you you said you were going to FOS 4G, huh? FOS 4G NA down in San Francisco on the left coast. Yeah, that's going to be good. Coming up early March. So I'll be talking uh, post just there twice. Once for uh, once for the FOS 4G track and once for the EclipseCon track. It's co-located this year with EclipseCon. So I'm really interested to see how that turns out because we're going to have this sort of bigger corporate entity floating around. And we're going to, you know, there'll be talks about crazy Java stuff. It's, yeah, a, a lot of people are a little scared of that. A little clips to see. Yeah, I don't know. GeoServer guys more. would love it, though. Right? GeoServer guys would have been there anyway. There's an extent, right? Because EclipseCon is very Java-esque, right? So all mm -hmm. the Java people are really, they're probably okay with that. See folks kind of going, eh, I don't know. From my point of view, if you bring folks in the door, get the word out, can't be bad. No one gets hurt. Yeah. yeah well, where where's uh where's the international conference this year? Is it in Europe? Seoul, oh. South oh. Korea, Asia. Yeah. Has yeah. there been a successful oh. Asian version of this yet? There have and there have not. Right. So the international conference has not successfully landed in Asia unless you count the very first Foster G ever, which was in Bangkok, Thailand, back in two thousand four. Um. And we've had some sort of far and away conferences that have worked pretty well. Sydney was really good. Um, South Africa was amazingly good. But, uh, yeah, so you asked the question because China didn't happen, which was three years ago now. Um, but the difference here is this, this, the Japanese and the Korean communities have been having these local conferences every year. And their local conferences turn out three or 400 people every time. No problem. Um, and that was something that wasn't happening in China. So we're going to a country that already has a big on-the-ground foster G presence. So we'll just be adding the international stuff to what's already a, a pretty vibrant local scene. And the best part for me is you get to meet these folks who otherwise you would just – that the language barrier is a lot more real when you're talking about between English and the Asian languages than, than between English and the European folks. Um, there's just a lot of folks there who, even though they actually have great English, feel a lot more um, diffident about using it and exercising it. So getting in front of folks and being able to talk to them face-to-face -face is wonderful. And we'll hear a lot about projects in the open source world in Korea and Japan that otherwise you wouldn't hear about at all. I got to go to the regional Japan news conference three years ago, and that was one of the things I noticed. Like, there's all these talks. Some of them are about things I already know about, but a good half of them are about things I've never heard about before, and it was wonderful. Well, that's cool. When, when is it? When, when is it? Uh, so that'll be early September. I can't give you the exact dates, but 2015.fosfrey.org. I think it's the cool. second week of September. What's been your favorite phosphor G that you've been to yet? International, local. <laughs> Boy. Boy. Actually, my favorite one so far has been Denver. That was a good one. Um, it was really good. It was near the biggest, if not the biggest. Uh, because I'm a North American bigot, 
the fact that you know North American location meant that lots of people who were coming there were from the region. So they when they talked about their problems, there were problems I could sort of empathize with or understand in a way that maybe I don't get that same sort of connection with the folks in Europe. And uh, and it was the first one in a while where I really hadn't overcommitted myself. So I actually got to go to talks as opposed to just being 100% on the floor, 100% doing sales talk and so on. So it was the best one for me in terms of size and scope and not having to be on the ball all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of these things where it's it's nice to do it locally because you know everybody, you know, there's a big crew that you already know. Um and it's comfortable, but um, the one I didn't get to go to that I really wish I could have gone to was South Africa. I thought that would have been same. Cool. That's why I've got a perfect string, except no South Africa. That's the one I didn't go to. No, and yeah, well, that is amazing. Yeah, the uh, oh, people are saying my end is causing problems. Let me get earphones on. Yep. Suit up, man. I know you try not do it, but. I had it working perfectly a year ago and just got a man up, look cool. Yeah. All right, hold on. That's right. You got a coach team, man. What's the play, coach? Call it in. Flea sucker? You're muted. I can't, I can't run the play if you're muted. On. There we go. Yes. Holy Watch cow. Ah, I look like a. I look like I'm a head coach. Yeah, that's totally. Let's run a pass play on the one inch line. <laughs> okay. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, uh, if only I watch sports, so I get that. Well, you you're Canadian. You, okay, so here's a funny story. Um, coming from LAX on Monday. Um, drop my car off at Avis. I'm on the bus going to the airport, and it's completely full. Everyone's on their phones like they always are, but there's one guy that's on one of those new BlackBerry Square things. What terminal do you think he gets off on? The WestJet terminal. <laughs> I, he got on. He's like, I'm WestJet. I'm like, big surprise. Yeah. The last bastion. It's sad. It's unfortunate. You lose your national. What are the What are the Finns gonna do when Nokia? I guess. What are, What are the Finns doing? Nokia is. Yeah, I was gonna say that already happened, didn't it? Yeah, it's too late. Yeah, game over. What do the Swedes use? Anyways, that's a good question. We'll wait for the Swedes to answer that. Yeah, I mean, Eric's is there an Ericsson phone anymore? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's but the market is very much compressed, and we're seeing some of that in our field too, aren't we? Well, we already saw it once. We saw cool, the market man. compress on the desktop. There is only one desktop. One true desktop. One true desktop. Yes, there is. Yes. It's it's interesting. So so you know you're at, so get back on Carter DB. We just sort of went off there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are, what are you gonna? I mean, so what do you do now? Same thing you're doing before, just mudge along. Just a with, different platform to some extent. You know, tell people about the magic of open source, the magic of doing, doing geospatial without you know pulling out the big cellophane wrapped box to GIS. That's kind of the same magic. Um, the difference instead of sort of uh, the soup to nuts aspect of Boundless, you know, you got to get the software, install it, put it together, run it on your own infrastructure. There's a lot more of a, it's there, it's waiting for you. But from my point of view, I mean, the big magic is that underneath it all, it's still post just So you yeah. can still do all the incredible stuff. But now instead of having a rendering chain, which I have to deploy myself, I got a rendering chain which is sitting there in the in the cloud and can handle all the beating that uh, that anyone wants to throw at it. Yeah. So I've already had some fun publishing web maps and saying, "Look at this cool stuff," and not having to worry about whether loads gonna take it down or not. It's not my problem. The, so I think a lot of people are folks in Madrid's problem. Yeah. No, a lot of people know that that CardoDB uses PostGIS, but I mean, can you, for you know, we don't have an hour. Well, we have an hour here, but to not take them an hour, you know, can you kind of explain? You know, yeah, the magic. Works? Yeah, sure. So, from the point of view of a user, it's just a cool website. So you say, I want a new table, and you toss a shapefile at it, toss a CSV at it, and it says, voila, you've got a table. What do you want to do with that? And you say, well, I want to color it up this way, that way. That's this lovely sort of user-friendly editor that likes to make pretty maps. Um, 
but the secret is that hiding down below that wonderful UI view is the database that holds the table. The database is actually PostGIS. And the part that makes me it makes it interesting to me is that that pretty user interface doesn't just stop at the part where you, you point and click and you mouse around. You can pull back the covers a bit. So yeah, there's a wizard where you can do the simple styling stuff, but you can also flick to the Cardo CSS tab and put in as much Cardo CSS against your table as you want. And even better, you can flip to the SQL tab and the default SQL statement is just select star from your table. But you can replace that with anything you want. Oh, cool. So and it is can there be a... anything against the table you want, or it can be anything against the other tables in your account. So you can do joins, you can do <laughs> spatial analysis. Um, it's all the stuff you can do in PostGIS, but... Pop from, a web, from a web UI, essentially. From a web UI. And it's not just that it's from a web UI, but I mean, that's sort of the cool part from a GIS user. I'm configuring my stuff part from a, I'm now going to take this really cool map, which shows an interesting story, and send it out to the world. Um, you can send it out to the world and have a million people hit it, and it's not going to go down. Because in addition to having the cool database infrastructure, the cool rendering infrastructure, uh, they have a wonderful job tying that whole cloud aspect into a content delivery network. So you can bang it as hard as you want, and it's not going to stop. So what what would you say is the big difference between, I mean, uh, there's a huge difference here, but this is a, yeah. a lame question here, uh, Fusion Tables and CardoDB? Because I always see those two being ex compared, but yeah, yeah, yeah. once you go through a little bit yeah. that, house, people say, oh, that's just like Fusion Tables. Yeah, except it's not. Well, it's, it's, it's very similar, actually. You've got a table, you can color it up. Uh, it's probably the biggest difference is that it's, it's not just one table at a time. So you can build any interaction you want between all the tables in your account. So from the point of view of a spatial database, you can do a spatial join. That's something you can't do in Fusion Tables. Okay. Um, is there going to be like a PG to uh, CardoDB tool here soon? <laughs> uh, kind of is already, right? The OGR supports CardoDB, uh -huh. so you can slurp it down. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, my cool, awful hack on PG to Card the other direction. PG to CardoDB doing a live replication up from your local post just up to CardoDB. That's kind of a fun hack. Um, and uh, and I've been working on a, what's called a foreign data wrapper for Postgres that allows you to tie any remote OGR data source to your database. Oh, so you'll be oh. able to define a table local to yourself and have it automatically reflect all the changes that happen in your CardoDB account, um, and then the next revision, I'll have it read write, so you can actually write to your table and then have it be able to push up those changes to CardoDB, and vice versa. Oh, that's neat. That's a, automatically, as they say. Automatically, yes. Yeah. Just a little couple so lines. It's all over it. HTTP, so it's unbelievably brittle. <laughs> well, that's the easiest way to get it done, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's sort of a good segue. So what, I mean, we talked, we had a uh, Post just, uh, I think it was a 2.0 one about a year ago, didn't we? Uh, talk with uh, you yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we talked so, a lot yeah, about the rafters. Rafters. We actually yeah. that was that was post just day, and we got all the Postgres people together and the post just people together and talked about what's going on. And that actually, from the point of view of saying, you know, what's great and new with post just is almost a preferable format because I'm surprised that the world of post just moves. Not so much faster than I can keep up with, but in, in deep areas that I find it hard to keep up with. So a lot of the work in the last year has been around 3D. It's being done by the guys in France. And I can see the stuff which has hit the repository, but I'm not really clear on what's going to just sort of drop in on us by surprise as we get towards release time. But they've been doing a lot of work tying PostGIS to a computational library called Seagal, C-G-A-L which has full volumetric support. So the ability to do volumetric extrusions and then do um, actual 3D volumetric intersections, um, crazy stuff uh, like skeletonization, all this stuff is coming out of the Seagull library. And, uh, and they just keep on adding new stuff. It was kind of the same thing that happened back when we first brought Geos in. It's like, okay, first we bind in the obvious five functions, then we go, well, look at that, there's 15 other functions we could bring in. Let's bring those in too. And eventually you've got the whole library exposed through SQL. So that's kind of happening incrementally with Seagull now, too. 
Wow, I mean, I'm just thinking about it. I'm, like, trying to put my head around that. It's like, oh, my goodness. Right? I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, what do you do with volumetrics? I mean, you're, are you an oil and gas? Do you do oil and gas consulting? Because those uh, are the guys the who love does, volumetrics, but I don't. Right? Yeah, I yeah. Don't. I'm a, I'm a vector guy. I write rasters and volumes and three. Eh, I like a 2D flat polygon and yeah, maybe the put world a point down in a line. I feel a classic cartographer. Oh, I can buffer that for you if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> the universal operation. Why not do GIS? Why not? I mean, we, that's yeah. the first thing any GIS person learns. Like, I have a line. Let me buffer it. You know, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I'm a professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever happened to doing raster? And raster analysis is a key component of GIS. You know, I, I, I that you, I mean, belt. everything was raster, right? Yeah, that was we, the only way to do it at the back in the yeah. day, right? Yeah, we years ago we worked on this project. It was in Colorado. And we had to find a Air National Guard uh, uh, bombing range, a new one, build a new one in Colorado. And they didn't know where to put it, but we created this little you know model, and it was all raster. And we took this raster thing and moved it all over the state. And the only way to get this thing to run without crashing was this guy created this thing in Fortran because uh, Arc Info would crash after a while. So he created this custom Fortran raster, and we just took these ASCII grids and just... <laughs> Across, yes. Yeah, it worked, and it printed out a nice pieces of alternating red, uh, white and green uh, printer paper. It was... Uh... Proving the point. Everybody, everybody writes their own GIS. At some point, everybody writes their own GIS. Yeah. Well, it also brings the point that uh, the printer, you have to figure out scale because the printer head is uh, yes. fixed scale and you have to figure out how to oh, match it up. Oh, yeah, match yeah. It up. Back in the good old days, physical limitations. <laughs> but you're right. We don't do a lot of raster anymore. I mean, people play with rasters, but it's from an aerial imagery yeah. perspective, not a let's do a raster analysis and figure out veg types and... Yeah, 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 and there's so much power. There's so much power in map algebra as a way of understanding GIS pro problems, and it's strange we've sort of just sort of discarded it. Yeah, I mean, and cell we sizes. For crazy yeah. reasons. Yeah, exactly. We discarded for reasons of cell size. Oh my gosh! Well, we can't have little jaggedy corners because you know that that annoys my eyes. Yes. It doesn't matter that the actual cell size is well below the accuracy of the input data. Well, you know, it's every still, time oh, every time you look at, at it, I zoom in, I see squares. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you look at a shape file and someone has an area field, it's calculated out to the tenth decimal point, right? I mean, it's well, it must be accurate because it goes out all those decimal points. Yes, exactly. Other, other than the fact that my poor eyesight digitized that line in manually on some uh, scanned PDF that some guy, you know, put in a fax machine and sent it to me. Exactly. Well, the the forest cover in British Columbia was always calculated carefully, quantized to a millimeter. <laughs> was it really? Oh yes, yes. As you know, that was that was the way it was stored in MicroStation. That was the finest precision they could get in UTM. Get it down to the millimeter. Oh, I, I, well, that's sort of a Canadian thing, anyway. We wouldn't do that in the United States. <laughs> no, millimeter. No, you're not so persnickety. Tenths yeah. of an inch. So, tenths of an inch. So, what else is new? So, 3D stuff. Oh, the raster stuff's got a lot of work. And I'm actually playing with raster today, which has been fun. So, raster stats aggregation. That's a little less. You don't have to hand roll it yourself so much anymore. Uh, you can actually build raster overviews in the database now. You don't have to do it in an external process before you kind of had to load them with the overviews in Google, or God help you, if you forgot to do it, you'd have to unload them and reload them with overviews. Um, and then retiling. So if you load them on a particular tiling basis and you don't like it, you can retile them smaller or larger. That's pretty nice. Yeah. So it's getting a little easier to manage those rasters in post -gis. Um The work I've been doing, sort of playing today, is around weather forecasting. That's been pretty fun. It's like, yeah. that's about just the size of rasters I want to deal with. My chipped raster table doesn't come up to more than 2,000 rows. You know, it's not so big. It's very reasonable. Yes. We've got a question. Hey, Paul, I'm in the oil and gas industry in Calgary. Where do you see volumetric support helping the most? Oh, see, now you're getting well beyond my pay grade. I've just always been told that you feel, folks uh, model your reservoirs as volumetric stuff underneath the ground so that then you can start to do stuff like, say, well, if I poke a, if I poke a stick down, a straw down from the surface here, what am I going to hit? Yeah, it's amazing how quickly Maybe I'll do that. Maybe it's all voxels. <laughs> it's, it sounded like you knew what you were talking about, and then clearly... Wasn't that great? Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, Never no, I keep waiting. I understand. I'm waiting for the oil and gas people to come and start talking to me because I understand that's where the big bucks are or used to be, as the case may be. Yeah, and you can stay in Canada, so. Exactly. It's, it's all good. Another question uh, from IRC, Matt Baker. Paul, anything going on with weighted overlay in PostGIS? No idea. See, Not the old days I could ask you these questions and you knew the answer because... Yeah, well, of course, that's a, it's, an, it's kind of a, a hard question. What do you mean by weighted overlay, Matt? Put it in the IRC. I've got it right next to me. But, you know, if it's vector versus vector overlay, just weight it yourself. You stick the weights into the SQL and it's done. If it's uh, raster on raster, I don't actually know the answer. Well, it happens. It happens. Yeah. Um, What's uh, what's the what's the the way forward with PostGIS? I mean, what's the next big? So you talked about volumetric, but uh, what are the next areas you guys are focusing on? I think there's a little bit of work to be done in spatial stats that we're not there on. Like yeah, we say oh go go and do it in R, and yes you can, but that's inconvenient. That's sort of a it's a cop out. So a little bit of surface fitting I think is kind of required. We've got to do a little bit of that and some clustering. It's it's crazy we don't have some inbuilt clustering algorithms available for folks. That makes a lot of sense on the sort of the GIS analysis side. Other than that, I feel like we're running out. There's some neat stuff that's come in again from Seagull, you know, skeletonization routines. I feel like there's a there's a place for a simplification. And it's something we hit a lot in, in the Carter D B side, which is the problem of um, people throwing a 30 million dot record table at you and saying, render that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once we render it once, it's in the cache and it's all fine. But that first render, that could take a long time, particularly the you know the fully zoomed out square. And the way to get around that is do some kind of intelligent simplification so that what you end up rendering is what the data set means when you're zoomed that far out, not just a big blue blob, but maybe the quote unquote important bits. So being yeah. able to algorithmically figure out what the important bits are in a data set. That's a hard, important that's a hard thing to do. I mean, oh yeah. You oh guys yeah, already that's doing science stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel lucky. Let me generalize. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, I mean, a lot of a lot of this visualization stuff is at that level, right? I feel lucky and God knows most of it shows up great. Yeah. We did heat maps, released the heat mapping function two days ago. Fabulous. You can get a long ways with heat maps because that's the ultimate and I feel lucky visualizations. It's yeah, sexy. It's great. Your eyes, that's kind of what reality looks like, isn't it? Yeah, especially if you're looking for uh, Starbucks locations. You can see it's really red. <laughs> that's right. There. Well, Starbucks locations, like everything of interest, are where people are. <laughs> so you get the where people are map. Yeah. At least in North America. Oh, well, well Matt. Oh yeah, the wall of text. You laid the wall of text on us. Yeah, and then look it up on the Stack Exchange. Yeah. Thanks, Matt, for <laughs> you got that, Paul. <laughs> okay, we'll do it. All right there. Yeah. Um. So you think? Well, so okay, so so that's I mean, that's the next thing on the post just side. I think there's there's other next things on the Postgres side that are going to make a lot of difference to how people use things. Um. And I got to go to PGCon this year in Ottawa, and if you're like if you're a Postgres nerd, I can't recommend it highly enough because all the all the developers go there, and I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, what folks like Robert Haas and Tom Lane, who are like the key super hackers, have to say about parallel processing, because that's that's the problem we got to crack. Yeah. For uh, for Postgres and PostGIS, because we got all these cores, we got all these cores sitting around, and we're not using them, so we need the infrastructure to start parallelizing. How big is that conference? No, it's, it's not big because it's kind of like, I mean, they hold the Linux Summit in Ottawa, too, every year. And it's a couple hundred people, but it's the people. And it's the same thing. So there's about 250 people, maybe, show up to PGCon. But it is every major developer is there. So yeah. if you want to get your real questions answered, there's some place to be. I might have to go one year just to... <laughs> Yeah, suck it all Just to get my mind blown and sit in half the sessions where I have no idea what they're talking about. Those That's good. Fun. There's the mix. There's some practical stuff as well as the crazy stuff. There's a lovely there. Last time I was there, Tom Lane did a... I guess all their sessions are an hour, so it's like two contiguous hours on the uh, the Postgres query planner. Like, oh. 
And, and his stated reason was, you know, I'm the only one who understands this, so I have to get some other people who understand this. Yeah. I, if I die, you're all screwed. Yeah, it's just too much of a project risk for more people not to understand what's going on. <laughs> Someone just asked, when is Post just coming out for my sequel? <laughs> Never. I mean, they're building it themselves. Sort they're building of. it themselves. Sort of. But they've actually rolled in some of the things that used to be sort of hack patches on the side. So you can do... If you're working on one table, you can probably do some passable operations. I think it still just falls over itself and dies if you try to do table joins. Mm -hmm. um, but they're getting there. It's clear that it's not a priority. All right, here's, here's another question. What NoSQL features are coming to Postgres, PostGIS? Oh, that's, that's, that's a lob right over the plate, right? So, yeah. I yeah. Think <laughs> what do you freebie. think about that, Paul? <laughs> what can I tell you? It's a great so, idea, and I wish you guys did it more. <laughs> no sequel. So what is this no sequel of which you speak? <laughs> you know, um, I'll assume you mean document database for now. Uh, so Postgres now has uh, it had actually for quite a while. It's had XML column types and JSON column types, but in 9.4 they brought in a binary JSON type, which is about 50 times more efficient than the old text-based type. Um, it's got full indexing. It's got the ability to sort of peek into the document, sort of do queries which peek in and are indexed against particular document components. And uh, the best part is it's really, really fast. Um, they've actually taken it and benchmarked it and said, you know what, as a document data store, it's just as fast as Mongo. And you have the option to treat it uh, basically as a partially NoSQL database. So you don't have to just say, well, all I've got are these documents and keys to these documents. You can say, well, I've got this hybrid model where I've modeled out the things I know that are there and they're sort of guaranteed parts of my model as columns, bang, bang, bang. And the parts which are fluid, which I'm not really sure about or I haven't specified yet, I'm going to model as a document column sitting off the edges. So you get sort of the belt and suspender asp suspenders aspect. You've got your relational model for the things which are set. For things which are fluid, you can have documents in there and, and have attributes which are maybe there, maybe not there, um, and have you know what the ORM guys want, which is this ability to sort of arbitrarily extend the model without having to change the underlying database as you extend the model of the application side. So I think from a NoSQL point of view, you got no excuse. You got no excuse not to use Postgres. <laughs> so quit your whining. Quit your whining. Use but, your use your use your MongoDB to store your usernames and do everything else in, in Postgres. A repeated theme as I've run across um, systems people so far um, has been running across folks who get, yeah, we tried Mongo and I never want to do it again. I'm going back to Postgres, or I went to Postgres, and I'm a lot happier. And I don't think it's because it doesn't sort of meet the contract of I can throw up a cluster, and it's it's quick and easy to do that. It's probably doesn't meet the contract of reliability and predictability in the same way that Postgres does. It might be a little finickier to get your Postgres up and running in the way you want it initially, because you got to kind of think about how the parts ought to go, go together in the most optimal yeah. way. But once you get it going, you kind of forget about it. Well, I think it's always sort of been like, too. it works, it just works. You get it running, it just works. That's why you can never make a living as a, as a post-just hacker because, you know, it just works. <laughs> There's like, only like two companies in the world that don't employ me anymore, and I've worked for both of them. Yeah, what what now? Don't blow this. Do not blow this, Paul. <laughs> exactly. It's my last chance. <laughs> the only one left would be Esri, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. I always wonder about that, you know, how much uptake they're really getting on the Postgres side. I am they have to be... Well, I'm going to be finding out looking real soon. Sort of relationship to PostGIS. Oh, PostGIS, we don't recommend it. We recommend you use ST Geometry. Is well, that still the recommendation? No, they're telling. I, I'm going to. I have a PostGIS I installed this week on a new server, and I'm going to install ArcGIS Server 10 on it. And I've been told that it works natively, beautifully, and you don't have to do anything special. Uh, the only clean clients need is ArcGIS Server running, but otherwise, the clients talk to PostGIS using PostGIS data types and everything. So we'll find out. That's the promise. That's we'll the promise. Yeah. I mean, the, the days of installing SDE and using those special tables that nobody knew how to do. And yeah. Well, I thought the special tables were still there. 
You know, so I mean, you still you've got well, a table. Probably which are is still there, right? A raw post post just table that you can work on with any way you want. But I I don't know the geo database stuff. If you're going to do versioning, if you're going to do yeah. Some of the fancier stuff, you're still stuck with all the side tables and that extra complexity. Yeah, the the, the proprietary nature of some of the things they do requires them to uh, throw some dirt around. But that's uh, one of these areas I would like to have more time to poke into because uh, it's one of these things. Talking with folks who have done it, there is actually a fair amount of smarts hiding there. Um, in terms of, yeah, you've got ArcGIS and it talks directly to your Postgres and it's got all the side tables and magic occurs, but um, if you install uh, the Esri Utility SQL into your Postgres, there's actually a whole bunch of SQL functions that'll let you interrogate the geodatabase model directly, without having to use the ArcGIS stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, I used, I tried it three years ago, and it was an absolute disaster. And they told me exactly what they told you. <laughs> you probably yeah. want to choose a different database. We recommend uh, SQL Server 2008. Yeah. Uh, now they seem to be just saying, "Hey, use whatever you want. We're all good." That's good. Uh, we'll 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 see. I'm a little nervous. Well, I'm in DC next week, but the week after, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. Damn it! And we will find out. <laughs> yes, yeah, just reality <laughs> match up. The promise. It's always difficult. You make the promise, and you hope it's you hope it's for real. Well, I haven't paid attention to it, so I asked it on Twitter, saying, "Hey, what are the gotchas to doing this?" Everyone's like, "What do you mean gotchas? You just do it." And I'm like, "What do you mean? It never works." They're like, "Oh, of course it works. Why wouldn't it work?" And you're like, "Oh, well, maybe it works, and maybe I'm an idiot for thinking it doesn't work because I haven't paid attention." So I'm sort of a little excited here because maybe it's a brave yeah. new world. Oh, could be, could be that. So I got I got to bring one thing out because I got whatever 100, 120 of your f best friends listening, and that is. Um, one of the big, awesome pieces of PostGIS news last year was AWS bringing out um, Postgres on RDS, which was nice enough in and mm -hmm. of itself, but they also included PostGIS support. In RDS. Like, you know, uh, fist pumpingly awesome. They have not updated their PostGIS version since then. What is it stuck so, on? One point something? 2.1.0. Point, at least it's on 2. <laughs> <laughs> it's not 2.0, although actually a higher version of 2.0 might be better than the low version of 2.1 because 2.1.0, being our first patch release of the 2.1 series, was fairly rapidly updated with bug fixes. Uh, in the case of the 2.1.3 or 4 release, pretty major security holes yeah. um, were patched up. So, uh, so if you are an Amazon RDS client or customer, send an email to Amazon and say, Update your PostGIS. You got no excuse. Please. It's been uh, it's been going on a year since they were first told they should update. Um, it's been going on six months since the last time I exchanged emails with them. Interesting. They well, that's the problem with Amazon. I mean, it's this big monolithic AWS thing, and there's like no face to it. There's you meet people that work on the team. <laughs> yeah. But whenever you ask a question, then they always say. They always say, well, I don't know that part. That's not my part. There's some other guy here. They give you some guy's card, and you, you call him, and they never return yeah. the call. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, the trouble is they're breaking the promise of the cloud, right? The promise of the cloud is I don't have to worry about infrastructure management because yeah. these experts will keep magically. everything in the best possible shape. And this is a case where it's not being kept in the best possible shape. So well, maybe that's the promise one, of the cloud. Because one would use CardoDB. Oh, we did exactly. we just jinx each other right there? We wow. just segue in the circle, just like that. Like we're right back to where we began with. Uh, so you're, so you, you were you kind of alluded to this earlier. I don't know if it was when we were on live or before. Um, yeah. Going from boundless that you have to install everything manually. Um, you know, it's very powerful, yeah. but there's it requires you to have a place to install it, the rights to install it, and succeed in installing it. Versus CardoDB, which you, you know for free, and then you throw a credit card in and it works bigger. Um, yeah. it's, it's quite a different change for you. Um, uh, there's some of it's positive, some of it's negative. We focus on positive, but I don't want to say they're negative yeah. things, but what are some things someone should realize before they dump their GeoServer stack and move to the cloud um, that they need to think about before moving to such a system? Um, one of the things I have found jarring is that I am used to having 
complete command line access to my database. And, uh, and with CardiB, I've got sort of these much narrower straws to access it because I don't have direct um, database connectivity from my database client to the backend database. I'm going through a web API. Yeah. And by and large, the web API just passes the SQL back. And the only restriction is you can't run a SQL query that runs more than a certain number of seconds. That's basically CardiDB's way of keeping themselves from being destroyed by, uh, by a user who wants to run a, a denial of service attack on them. Mm. You can't just run it a, an update or a query which is going to run for 36 hours and yeet up 100% CPU. They'll keep track and say, well, wait a minute, you've been going on too long. I'm going to stop that. <laughs> so it's not, it's not, a lot of people use PostGIS for what, uh, what might previously been used, they might previously have used ArcGIS for. I'm going to do a big long running analysis. Yeah. And I don't care. I'm just going to set it running and go get coffee. I'll be back in half an hour and we'll see if it's done. Um, that's not something you can use your CardiB version of the data for. You can use it for publishing. You can use it for um, web analytics where the analytical run is a relatively short run. You know, a quick join and, and colorization kind of a thing. Uh, but you can't use it for analytics where the run is going to be a 15-minute go. Yeah, and, and that's that's part that I find a bit. And I almost feel like we need to do the extra work to get our, our bidirectional connection up and running sooner than later because then it allows us to sort of say, hey, it's have your cake and eat it two time. What you do is you run a nice big local analytics database and then you have foreign tables that point up to CardiDB and you have it push your final results over there yeah. and shove it up to the cloud so you're publishing the final stuff but you're actually doing your big churns locally because they're really quite, they're two different requirements. Yeah, I think They so. are and so that's, that's a very good point right because a lot of these tools are not to simplify it, but are visualization methods taking the database and visualizing it and they're not designed yeah. for running that long analytics. Yeah. Um, What's what are some cool things you've discovered? I mean, I mean, because you, you're two weeks in, some things you just said, "Holy cow!" I had no idea people were using Carter <laughs> D for this. Um, the ability to do temporal visualization is pretty awesome over the web, and that's something that I haven't seen anywhere else. And within, I think it was week one, I already did one. It's like, huh, wow, I can do temporal visualization. So really any table um, that has a time column, it's a, it's a trivial kind of click, click, click to get it showing you the stuff moving around. And more recently, you can actually make the heat maps dance around depending on time. Yeah. So that's, that's one. It's like it's always easy to make a time-based table. It's really kind of hard to see it. Yeah. So having those tools, that's been like, that's been a really oh, wow point of view. Um, the other one is the database behind CardiB is huge, and by which I mean, by which I mean, it's it's got to be a monstrous machine. I don't know. <laughs> um, I haven't had a chance to actually sit down with the infrastructure guys and say, you know, how many machines are we running? But it's not it's not a thousand tiny machines. It's not thousands of small machines, and it's it's not hundreds of medium machines. I think it's like tens of unbelievably massive machines, yeah. because. Uh, because I did an index build on a two million record table, and I'd run it locally, because I sort of proofed the concept on my local machine, then pushed the data up and ran it on the on the main machine, and it went, bloop. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? I like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is nice. I can do a lot with this. this. Yeah. Laptop. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's cool. Um, yeah. Well, I thought we could talk a little spatial IT because um, yeah, something yeah. people still are, are curious about. Um, I don't know. I think you coined the term originally. Yeah, Foster uh, North America, Washington D.C. Yeah. I thought, uh, you know, what is it? What does it we do, right? And it's always like, wow. When people say they do GIS, they mean something fairly particular. Yeah, um, I, I'm a biologist. It generally has to do with digitization or making a piece of paper or if they're really lucky doing some cool analysis you know figuring out something about the environment in the world and making a report um, there's a lot of one timiness about doing GIS generally speaking I make the data I put it together I get a result I hand it to my manager um, 
but it's not really descriptive of what a lot of organizations are doing operationally, which is starting to just say, I've got data flowing in, and then I do some stuff with it, maybe I store it for a while, and then it flows out and people look at it. Um, and there's not a lot of manual <laughs> effort in between those steps, and yet it's not just a banking app. There is some smarts required to understand what happens on the way through and what the implications are when you render it and visualize it on the way out. Um, but those, those smarts are not really the same smarts that we need to think about when we talk about doing GIS. They're different smarts. There's the spatial IT smarts. There's smarts that say that um, SQL is a valuable tool and JavaScript is a valuable tool and Python is a valuable tool. Um, but that, uh, you know, digitization is not a valuable skill and paper production is probably something you'll never do. And if you're only doing it once, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. When I joined uh, URS again, I had to come up with a title. <laughs> you know, and I thought, hey, I'll call myself Spatial IT whatever. Yeah. And I filled it out and it got accepted and I was like, awesome, I'm now the spatial IT, I'm the only guy who does spatial IT <laughs> in a company of 55,000 people. I mean, you know, yeah. everybody does it, but um, the funny thing is I came down to re get new new business cards and they told me it wasn't a real job. <laughs> <laughs> so what is a real job? What are all the people who, in the company who are doing this stuff calling themselves? Well, you know, it's GIS manager or oh, GIS, yeah, 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 senior yeah, yeah. GIS analyst or... GIS technician. Uh, it's still. I, I was able to hold on to it, but it was just funny yeah. that, that you know it's you know it's the slowly thing that people are coming enlightened about really what they're doing. Yeah. They're not just doing. I'm not just buffering things. I'm not. I mean, if you are, yes. you're just you have a miserable life. Um, but there's more to what we do than just doing GIS. Um, in fact, most of what I do in a day is not doing GIS. It's doing application development or, you know, prototyping yeah. or, you know, all these things that make the stuff that we create better and more usable. Um, but people are still stuck into these old ideas about, you know, what's my job title? What what do I do every day? Uh, well, uh, I think you've got a mix there, right? I mean, an engineering companies can be full of people who are literally doing old school GIS, right? They're taking data, absolutely. they're gathering it, they're dealing with it for the project. And when the project is done, they're done. It's a one-time kind of a thing. But at the yeah, same time, right. you have lots of infrastructural memory or institutional memory you're going to want to keep and archive and publish, and that problem is more of a spatial IT problem. It becomes interesting. I mean, from a consulting practice, because that's a, yeah. you know, it's essentially what we are. It's it's interesting because certain projects you take on the, um, you know, what the company you're working for is philosophy on something. So yeah. um, sometimes you work with Oracle because. You're getting paid to work with Oracle. Um, you know, if they asked <laughs> you, what you, hey, I work for money, right? If they asked yeah. me what would I use, I probably wouldn't say, you know what you really need to do? Get yourself an Oracle spatial license and start turning away. Yeah. Um, but you take on that mentality that they have. This is how it's done. And you know, they might not even call it GIS. They might call it data management or something like that. Um, then you work for a city that you know is very institutionalized, you know, classic GIS, and they've got all their different levels of GIS technicians and GIS yeah. analysts, and then they have a manager at the top that uh, signs time cards and things like that. Um, you know, and as a consultant, though, that's where I think spatial IT really comes in because you have to do both these things. You have to be the classic, you know, let me figure out how to buffer your, your center points of your roads 10 meters on each side to get how much uh, threatened red cockaded woodpecker there is on the side of the road. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got the, you know, spatial analytics that you're doing to solve, um, you know, BI problems, uh, big problems about, you know, moving infrastructure uh, around the world to, to, to help companies out. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's every day you sort of walk in and one time you're doing awesome stuff and you figure you're doing great things and the next day you're doing something. <laughs> you're just converting <laughs> shape files into posts, which is yeah. you know, nothing wrong with that. Uh, thank God we know how to script that stuff. But uh, um, So how do you publish? How do you publish right now? What's your publishing chain? For me, you can, I mean, if you can... In fact, well, if I came to you, I'm, a, I'm doing a project, I'm in your company, I say, hey, James, I've done some work, and I want to put it out on the web so people can see it. 
and you say you're going to do... Okay, so generally speaking, there's a database behind. Uh, if I have the choice, you're in Postgres, but you know, there's a good chance you're going to be in something that I didn't have a choice. Uh, Visualize-wise, we just try and do things with GeoJSON and uh, Leaflet. Um, because most of what people want to see are very simple results out of a complex database. Um, other times we were stuck in an Esri ecosystem and we're uh, developing applications for ArcGIS and their JavaScript API. Um, it's you know it's hard to say is there one thing you do because as much as I want to say I'm only ever going to do it this way. Um, yeah. But with the large applications we're writing now, a lot of them are PostGIS. Uh, maybe some geo server in there to do some some yeah, some things, but it's mostly yeah. yeah. But there's mostly leaflet um, mm -hmm. and doing as much geo JSON as you can uh, right out of the database. Uh, you know, the less middlemen you have between your visualization and your database, things run faster. People seem to like it, and you get better results. Oh, there you go. It's the architecture of evil. <laughs> it, well, there's something to be said about that, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. That's you know, that's that's the way to be. You got the smarts of the database. You got the rendering at the client. You need hardly anything in between. Surprisingly, you don't. Now, you know, if I wouldn't, you know, if there's scaling issues and things where you want to, uh, you know, tile and and things like that. Well, yeah. you know, maybe you want to throw some things in the middle to create tiles and stuff. But generally speaking, you know, even though I work for a huge hundred, I think we're 110,000 employees now. Most of the applications we write are work group, right? Because they're solving for specific projects, and there's not that many guys on it. So right. we can do things that um, are, you know, one off. Uh, you don't have to worry about, well, if, if you know, hundred thousand people hit this on the Tuesday, what's going to happen? Well, it never happens. Um, but the ones that we do do large projects, hey, we, you know, we have to go through all that problem thinking about, you know, how do we tile this? How do we scale this? Right. What does it mean to yeah. be uh, you know, if all of a sudden we're doing work for the BLM, you know, they're we're replacing their geo communicator application. It's like, you know, one day something could happen and hundreds of thousands yeah. of people want to hit this app one day. What does that mean? You know, I don't want to throw up a sweating server thing saying, sorry, <laughs> we're down. Uh, too many requests. Yeah, yeah. So well, actual it, web architecture. That's been uh, the nicest sort of introduction for me at, at CarterDB is coming in and seeing a system which, from my point of view, is just a database, but from the point of view of the world coming in is a proper web architecture, so you don't have to think about the scaling aspects at all. Yeah, Everything we produce before it arrives at you is being injected into the CDN. So you know, from, from a work group standpoint, you just create the app, right? I just start writing, coding, yeah. and, and but from an enterprise app, you got to think, okay, well, let's figure let's first create APIs. Because yeah. then we need to figure a way to talk, and you got a kind of server sitting there, and then you start coding against the server. And so this thing has to, you just don't start. I mean, you have to think of the architecture. You're sort of talking about that from a, a NoSQL versus SQL uh, you know, yeah. component. If I just want to create a table and just keep appending to the end of it, well, shoot, maybe NoSQL is just what I need. Um, <laughs> But if I actually want to think about the relationship between these tables and lookup tables and all those other great things, uh, how this thing fits together, you just don't, I mean, you install PostGIS, but you just don't start loading. You think about how you're going to do that. So, um, yeah. But that sort of gets at the, the key of spatial IT, right? Um, you could, a, a database person understands how databases work. Um, but you still need somebody who understands location, and I, I don't think there's a lot of that out there. Um, people ask simple questions for... Uh, you know, PostGIS, Oracle Spatial, SQL Server. But there's not a lot of people there that are doing that really deep, deep stuff. Um, and I think there's opportunities for folks out there to break outside of this just using PostGIS with GIS companies, but to go out there and say, hey, we're going to work with, you know, all these great, you know, Fortune 500 companies that use these software systems. The visualization these companies do is awful. <laughs> they can't even do it. I mean, it is, it is. Oh, they're still building store locators. Exactly, using MapQuest, <laughs> classic MapQuest. It's amazing that's a niche. Yeah, we do store locators. We built our business on it. What was it? I was looking for... How is this possible? Oh, it was a restaurant in L.A. just this weekend, yeah. and it popped up on MapQuest, and the icon for where the, the restaurant was was underneath an ad for uh, Holiday Inn. So you saw this big Holiday Inn <laughs> logo, and I'm like... I thought it was at the corner of whatever, and I zoom in enough, and you could see the Holiday Inn thing slowly move off the point. And I was like, "Really? Did anyone actually?" It's not like this restaurant has like 20 locations; they have two. You could have checked that before you used it. 
Why am I getting all angry? I, mean, nah, I don't know. I didn't start. should let it I wind you up. Yeah. I should have just asked Google. Right? Yes. I mean, you know how to do it. So that was a bit of a shock, actually, for me. I mean, it's been it's been good news for us as yeah. folks who can step in and and fill the gap. But uh, the Google walking away from Maps Enterprise seemed. Uh, I I'm I'm of odd. two mindsets on this, right? And I talked about this in my yeah. newsletter. I mean, one of them is either this is just such a small thing to Google. They just don't even care, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's just the rounding error on the rounding error. Yeah, yeah. Why are we even, why are we even here? We'll just have infrastructure, let everybody else do it. Or this isn't a very, this isn't a very popular uh, request. And companies such as Esri, Carter, DB, Mapbox, that specialize in this already have that market wrapped up. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's necessarily that. I think it's just Google is just not interested in it and they just want to just say, hey, eh, Focus, 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 focus. Yeah, and and so I, some people were, you know, the sky is falling. I saw on Twitter, like ah, uh, <laughs> but you know, I was surprised to see how little of that happened. You know, initially there was some of that, but I don't see people complaining about it, which leads me to believe no one really was using Google's product anyway. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> There's definitely many, many millions of dollars of of, of customer accounts out Absolutely. There. But um, I don't think it's yeah. From the point of view of Google, it's a rounding error and a rounding error. Yeah, so. I just I just don't think it's that an interesting market for them. And yeah. you know, we we at AECOM have Google Maps for Work uh, okay. agreement, so we yeah. work with that. But that's not the same thing as what we're, we we're talking about Google Maps for Enterprise. It doesn't allow you to store data. You have to use one of Google's already other APIs or bring your own uh, data infrastructure in. Um, it's probably good for. I mean, I think that's probably good for our industry. It basically yeah. says, "Hey, uh, this isn't as easy as all these companies thought it was going to be." Uh, no, and yet that still leaves them sitting in possession of the world's best base map. And that base map doesn't change. Far I mean, it's still going to be it, the, the importance of that base map never changes, right? I mean, no. you still need to navigate from point A to point B, which is what the first reason they created that thing. Um, but you know. People use. I find people use that more than they use Yelp to find good restaurants around them. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're using a mapping yeah, application. Not. Yes. Where's the best sushi around me? And it lists them all yeah. with a little plus. I don't know where those come from, but someone somewhere yeah. uh, says that it's a good restaurant. And that's what the twelve do. Google Plus users put those in for our benefit. <laughs> well, I'm, I've been lucky so far. They're a good group of people. They seem to rate their things yeah. well. But um, you know, it's. I, I just, I just don't. I don't think it's a. I mean, I don't think. I think it's a big deal for those who were using it, and it was important to their their, their applications. I don't want to minimize that. Yeah. Well, but it's on one the of these rare point. cases where um, choosing the biggest vendor actually turned out to be the wrong choice. I think it's a classic conservative IT decision making. It's like, what are we going to do? Oh, Google does it great. Yeah, I think it's a Google thing though, because they, 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 they are more than happy to walk away from anything they created. It's just their philosophy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well in some like respects, the Microsofts the, of the yeah. world, they would hold on to something for you know they still have MapPoint yeah. for some reason. Uh, that well, that's uh, in many respects that's a very admirable corporate attribute, right? I mean, if you're going to, as an enterprise, standardize on a product, you want to know that the product you're standardizing is not one that the vendor is just going to walk away from in short order. Yeah, we just just recently we had to give up at Windows XP just last year. So, uh. <laughs> and what have you moved to? Oh, you we, I, I, no, not me, but I was already just reach on, out and grab my face and move it around. <laughs> there was there was some survey guys at our at our office that were using some survey Kogo software that required Windows XP, so they had to upgrade to a new version of Kogo. Oh, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> that's generally the people that hang on to these applications, right? Uh, People that know. Okay, that, last uh, chance for questions from the channel. Yeah, they're just they're just mesmerized by uh, yeah. everything. So, so Fridays are quiet. That's all right. Well, it's, it's beer o'clock, right? Somewhere it is. Oh, back east it is. Um, yeah. You know, and it's snowing probably and miserable and it's sunny. And I'd show you this outside, but it's probably too bright for you to see out. <laughs> no. Look, uh, you understand? I'm one of the mushroom people. Yeah, I was gonna hold this outside in the, in the you know on my patio, but uh, it was too bright. My eyes were uh, my eyes were a little uh, squinty. And, you, know, you get older, you get the more you squint, the older you look. So I don't I don't want to. 
I'm doing my little Bradley Cooper thing today. I'm trying to grow a little Bradley Cooper beard. Oh, that's really nice. No. Yeah, the chicks like that, no? You've got one. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. Someone why told me Bradley they? Cooper's cute, but, oh, Paul, why did you why leave Boundless? I'd done it for, gosh, a long time. Six years, seven years. Was it that long? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like I started to look at it and say, wow. I joined in 2009. Started 2009. So, uh, I found myself repeating myself a lot. And uh, and that's good politics. You know, if you're a politician, you've got to be able to repeat yourself over and over again for people to get the message. But I don't think I'm a good politician. Um, I wanted to learn something new and, and say something new. And and one of the things I said and still say, and it's true about Boundless and, you know, doing enterprise open source on your own infrastructure is that that's not going away anytime soon or very fast, right? There's lots of organizations that are going to keep on doing that. Um, so there's a perfectly stable, perfectly good business there. But at the same time, I know by looking at the wider IT market is that at the end of the day, whether it's 5, 10, or 15 years from now, infrastructure is going to be built software as a service. It's going to be utility computing. It's going to be run at some data center, you know, who knows where. And you're going to interact it with it at an API level. Um, so there's a chance to sort of get on board and learn what's happening at the ground level on one of those new businesses. So got to do some of the old style, and, you know, Boundless ain't going anywhere. That old style is going to be around for a long, long time. But it's fun to go and see what the new style looks like because it's kind of a different way of thinking about problem solving. Yeah, that's. I mean, we all have to do our our turn at a cloud company. I did mine at WeoGeo. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. We all we all we all go through that. It it it, it, it is an education. When you see how the sa the sausage is made, it pretty much blows your mind. Because uh, <laughs> you have an idea how this stuff is done, right? You're like, oh yeah, it's just in the cloud, and uh, then you talk to the engineers, and you're kind of like, holy cow, there's some smart people out there doing some amazing stuff. Magic occurs. Magic yeah. occurs. I gotta say, I burned up far too much time today just figuring out how to upload uh, data to S3 using only curl. You could. There's a. Well, use the S3. What do they call it? Uh, command line tool. I can't remember what it's called now. Yeah, but I didn't want to install that. I wanted to do it with oh. curl. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out you gotta pipe things through OpenSSL to sign your stuff, and there's five yeah. different little bits. You gotta put an MB5 hash in there. It just goes on and on and on. God, I'm glad I don't have to work directly with Amazon infrastructure. Thank God someone else has that problem. Yeah, just 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 use your little curl app or, or put a wrapper on it. Make a yeah. make a Java wrapper to it and call it the uh, PG to uh, S3. Yeah. Well, oh, cool. NGA is going to be yes, NGA is going to be around for a long time. A long, long time, yes. They'll be running their own stuff for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, well good. Well. I appreciate you you taking a time out of your busy afternoon. Thanks for having me, James. Yeah, no, it's always good. It's uh, it's been a while. It's good to get back at these uh, hangouts, and uh, we got Mark Prelo on next week of uh, Prelo Advisors. We're gonna talk. Uh, okay. We're gonna it's talk a big picture. Some, yeah, we're gonna talk some car navigation. Yeah. Probably we'll talk yeah. some uh, smart home. Uh, disasters. We'll talk. Did you more. see the article yes. about the smart home? That was fabulous. That was yes. in Ballywag, I think, but probably published other places. Yes, the the incredible disaster of trying to run. It doesn't. Why would I want to turn on my lights with my smartphone? I I don't know. I have you know my security system can do this, and it's like you got to unlock it. <laughs> Are you no. kidding me? You Pump know the wall. Yeah, there's some guy I saw today. He had something. He uses this thing called Automatic, which is one of those companies they plug into your uh, your diagnostic port, you know, underneath your dash. Yeah. And it connects to your phone GPS, so it knows when he leaves his house. So he's got some sort of if this then that thing that runs some uh, curl script that uploads data to his work computer. So when he leaves home, it knows he when he gets to home, his work computer has all his stuff. He leaves work, it it's all been it. synchronized back. Nice. I was thinking we solved this problem with laptops uh, yes. 30 years ago, but what, you know, yeah. technologists, right? It, <laughs> idle hands are the work of the devil. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah, so we'll talk about that, and we'll probably talk some Google uh, Maps things. Uh, it should be a fun time. All right. Well, have we'll a good weekend. 
Look yeah, well, thanks that. everybody. Have a great weekend and uh, pitchers and catchers report next week. For so baseball is here. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing? Let's see I got again. I got this tonight. Let me see. Do I have that ASU season opener for baseball? Wow. So ASU versus uh, Ohio, Ohio State, uh, Oklahoma State, the Cowboys. The boys. Top of twenty-five college baseball matchup. Are the boys of summer really uh, to play in February? Uh, here they are. Uh, I think if you're a friend of mine went to uh, Penn State on a college uh, baseball scholarship, and he played pretty much the fir- February, or January, February, March in the uh, southern hemisphere of the United States, summer, summer, right. summer and a half, because there's snow on the ground. Yeah. So, but as he said, I got to spend a lot of time in Florida on someone else's time. So I was like, there you go. He's smart enough. All, All right, right, everybody. Thanks, James. Take care. Thank you, Bye. Paul. Bye-bye.